two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast with Mark and James. On a Friday in May, a sort of month that Shakespeare wrote sonnets about, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, I should say, the people listening in the Southern Hemisphere are going into weeks of gloom. But they don't do gloom in Australia. It's always bright and sunny. And, and no gloom, mate. Makes I, think, I think in uh, Kiwiland it is. That's true, yes. can get rainy. Yes. Um, but there, anyway, we're living in the North, so for once the, the North will rise again and get it right. Um, uh, are you having a good week there, Mark? I am, yes. Yeah. So we're recording this in the past. Um, so, yes. Uh, yes, I'm having... Am I having a good week? You um, live in the past. I think so, yeah, lots of work at the house at the moment. So it's all... Um, it's all we're actually going away tonight or tomorrow night because uh, we've got someone coming in to lay a wooden floor which is quite smelly apparently so we're going to be going to my mother-in-law's house um in the meantime what else we've been doing um yeah buying furniture it's all very busy because we, we moved uh three months ago so still in the process of filling the house with new stuff so um lots of money going out at the moment I need to sell more books Yes, well, you're selling quite a lot of books. A little a little update on your move to Kindle Unlimited, which has uh, been going great guns, according to the post in the Facebook group. Yeah, I think probably when this, how, how much would I have made? Pro- about four hundred thousand dollars since I went back into it. So um, yeah, it's been it's been well, you can't really dress up any other way. It's been an unqualified success. I'm I'm very pleased with, with how that's gone. Seven figure year. On at the moment, it looks that way. Yeah, we'll see. New book gonna, out as well um, as we record this on Monday, so that's going to be uh, interesting. To see how that performs. You um, you're going to stay in SPF, right? SP- <laughs> yes, I, I'll I'll stick around. Once your film deal's done and your seven figure author career, we'll never see well, you we'll, again. We'll just be filming for Malibu. Yes, yeah, that's fine. We'll do that. Well, you will be presumably. I'll still be in. No, I'll fly you out every week. Oh, thank you. <laughs> look forward to that. Get well. Think of the air miles. Okay, look, it's Patreon time, and um, we should really get into the habit of uh, of greeting our Patreon guests uh, on every episode. But um, we're doing it sporadically at the moment, and I'm going to say a welcome uh, to the newest members of our Patreon group. Most of them are golds, I notice. So let's. Uh, Let's move into saying hello to Ron Yarosh. Well, you, Ron, we've met Ron, haven't we, in Florida. He's a mm-hmm. lovely guy and has been a long-time member of the SPF community. Delighted, uh, Ron, that you are joining us on uh, Patreon, uh, supporting the podcast with a very small donation for each episode that helps pay for everything that we do. Uh, but I have to go up a bit when we start flying me out to Malibu. Uh, also going to say hello to Ron Radcliffe. Uh, Ron is from the United Kingdom. Uh, say hello and thank you to Sarah Tanzi. Sarah is also from the United Kingdom, from Devon. Uh, to Ninny Hammond. And Ninny's also a long-time member of the SPF community. Ninny, welcome to uh, Patreon. Thank you very much indeed from Louisville, Kentucky. Oh God, we got into so much trouble with the um, two letter abbreviations of states last time. So many people ticked us off, didn't they? And I thought, well, how many, how many American citizens would know the two letter abbreviations for English counties? And yet we got told off for not knowing some of them. I wouldn't, know, f- the, I wouldn't know the abbreviations for most English counties. It is a foreign uh, country to us. <laughs> But uh, there you go. We do our best. We love America and we try to learn your states, but please don't tell us off for not knowing all of them. Rana K. Williamson, who is from Fort Worth TX, which I think must be Washington, D.C. No, that's uh, I, I know, I know. Thank you. Uh, K- Carizia uh, de Verdier. What a great name. Carizia de Verdier, who is from Toronto. Toronto, I think some people say. Jennifer Ellison. Hello, Jennifer. Thank you very much indeed for sponsoring us on um, uh, Patreon from Parkland, Florida. Uh, Maria Eshova. Uh, hello, Maria. Thank you very much indeed for you. From Rotterdam in the Netherlands, just over the water there. Nikki Danforth. Hello, Nikki. Thank you so much indeed for sponsoring us on Patreon. Welcome to the podcast from Far Hills, NJ. She must be the Jersey Coast set. I can see Nikki there doing that. Um, for Hello to Mary Lee McDonald. Hello, Mary Lee. Thank you very much from Santa Rosa, California. Bill Duncan. Bill, thank you from Boral, New South Wales, Australia. Bill's Australian. Uh, Blair C. Howard. Um, Let's make sure I'm actually getting these uh, because they're very long lines on this uh, Excel spreadsheet. So actually, Blair is from Cleveland, Tennessee. 
Well, it says Cleveland TN. I think te- is TN Tennessee. We're going to get in trouble again. Cleveland is Cleveland like, is Ohio. I know, but it, it, there must be more than one Cleveland, right? In America, so, yes. He's for the United States of America. Uh, Angelina Kalahari. Hello, Angelina Kalahari. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on Patreon. Uh, to Nell Godin. Hello, Nell. And Jared Gulian. Jared, thank you very much indeed. Don't have locations for those last three. So if you want to uh, join the podcast, if you want to help us, you go to patreon.com forward slash SPF podcast. And all the gold level members get what, Mark? Uh, they get lots of stuff. Uh, they get entered into a draw once a year to get uh, the courses that we put out. Um, and uh, they also, they get a pin. Um, they get a pin. They get a chance to be a book lab guinea pig as well. And we've um, we've just selected the second one. So uh, We have. That will have been announced uh, via email to our Patreon uh, audience. But uh, I suppose, where are we going? This is going to go out the week on Friday. So I suppose we could announce it now, couldn't we? We could, yeah. Helena Harm, isn't it? Is the uh... it is Helena Harm. Helena Harm is the author, and I was just going to get up the um, the page, but I'm going to ruin the video if I do that, so I won't do that. Uh, Helena Harm, and it's called an English. I can't remember, but yes, it's um, kind of Scandinavian themed romance, I think. Um, so yes, we're going to be uh, looking at the first book in that series, and we will look at the cover with Stuart. We'll look at the blurb look at the, uh, the the kind of look inside with Jenny and we'll put it all together and see if we can make some suggestions to improve her sales. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely, as a budding author myself, I absolutely loved that Book Lab episode. I thought it was really insightful. I think this could be just in itself a really useful series. So uh, delighted we're doing this again. And I think a good choice, Mark, to move into a different genre so that we can cover uh, the way things are different between genres. So romance is the next one. Uh, Sorry, Helena, we've forgotten the name of your book. Uh, I know the English is in italics on the cover, and I'm already intrigued to know what uh, Stuart's going to say about that. But we'll... um, We'll get all that information together. And that episode at the moment is scheduled to go out on the 22nd of June. Uh, So put a date in your diary. Okay, so we're also talking uh, about SPF today, not Patreon, not Book Lab, but something called the SPF Foundation. So uh, as you know, we put together premium courses Uh, which are available and they are an investment uh, for some people that's a bit too much and we understand that and we always want to support uh, new authors we want to support authors who are there in everything else in terms of their writing their approach and their attitude um, but they're not there in terms of being able to afford the outlay at the beginning of their careers to get all the stuff in place that they need to have and that can be various people and we've chosen um, a, a small sample of people we've got three interviews today uh, with those people and they're cracking interviews in their own right uh, so this is not just meeting somebody who's got the foundation uh, status they are cracking interviews one of them in particular is uh, somebody who has been through uh, I was going to say been through the mill publishing it's a bit like you Mark has been through that journey of traditional publishing that was de- came away a little bit despondently and didn't work and is buying rights back from books wants to self-publish and is is struggling to get going so she's a good choice that's diana duncan laura fife is up in scotland not in fife in scotland but actually in sterling from uh, from memory um and ronnie verdi is in uh, fairfax virginia in uh, near dc in the united states and they're very all three of them very different characters so quite interesting to hear them um so we're going to have these interviews laura's and ronnie's uh, about eight minutes or so but diane i spoke to a little bit longer because i think she was very interesting on method and approach to writing and marketing and i think we learned something uh, talking to her just about um about that journey that uh, certainly authors are a little bit further on than where ronnie and laura are at the moment who've been involved with the old traditional industry and are now trying to transition uh, into indie publishing. I thought it was interesting in its own right. So let's hear from our new foundation uh, scholars. Laura, one of our fa- hi, one of our foundation um, students. So tell us a little bit about you. Tell us about your writing to where you are now. Uh, right now, I have published a few you know little pieces um self-published mainly because i think applying for the self-publishing formula gave me that little bit of a, a kick up from to say right okay let's just go for it so even just applying for the self-publishing formula um scholarship was a great experience and what- uh, so i've done a bit of poetry 
short stories and mainly I'm working on novels at the moment. Okay, and what sort of genre are you writing with your novels? Uh, I'm mainly writing uh, sort of half memoir at the moment. I'm writing about an English teacher who goes away off to a Buddhist retreat and that changes her life. So, okay. Uh, very memoirish. And another thing that you've done, and uh, in fact, it arrived just, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll be able to see this. It arrived um, about 10 minutes ago, which is very Fantastic. appetite for this interview, is a, a short book called Wellspring, which is already quite gripping uh, for me as a writer or trying to write, because it starts with the words. In fact, let me read out the first words of this, uh, of this book. Hello, I'm Laura, and I'm a procrastinator. And that's what this book is about. It's, a, it's called Wellspring, which is a kind of writing methodology. Do you want to just talk to us a little, about, a little bit about this? Yeah, yeah, that's, um, that's the main book that I have published, actually. I don't know why it slipped my mind. But it's, um, yeah, it's to help other writers. I'm a, I've been a, a creative writing tutor to adults now for about six or seven years, and I recently sort of gave that up so I could start taking my own advice for a change. And this was what I've, I've written to sort of say farewell to the writing classes and start taking my own advice. Uh, teachers are very good at do as I say, not as I do. Yeah, of course. Uh, I thought I'd better stop that and get on with some writing. So, so this book, um, which I just want to talk about for a bit because I think it's really interesting, um, is to help people stop dithering and start writing. Um, a lot of it's a little bit about understanding how your brain works. And you say at the beginning, you're, you know, this is not a psychology text. This is yeah. anthropomorphized to help make it easy. So we understand things like muses and, and influences and so on. But also there is that you seem to refer to, and obviously I've only had it for 10 minutes, so I have not read it yet, but you seem to refer to a particular methodology of called Wellspring, a type of writing. Is that, have I got that right or... Yeah, yeah, it can be called various different things, free flow writing or six, uh, usually in the writing classes I call it six minute writing. Um, so there's something about that six minute sort of time frame, but it's basically about how to use a prompt to help you get your writing going again and help build people's confidence. I think writers tend to struggle with confidence quite a lot, they're their own worst critics. So it's about getting past that critic and just letting the ideas come and reconnect with the joy of that and the enjoyment of it, really. Now, you mentioned a Buddhist retreat in your intro about your novel. You said it was semi-autobiographical, and there appears to me to be some Eastern influence potentially in this. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. I think that free flow writing is a very, is a very mindful experience. Uh, so it can be quite meditative when you're in that flow. Is, is very meditative. Um, maybe not restful, but it can be it, that um, that idea of ideas coming from another place and so that the subconscious and connecting with the subconscious and letting that all out. And I think it's about letting yourself get out of the way and taking your ego and your judgment and self-criticism, taking all of that out of the way so that um, you can just write. You can always edit it later on. But at the moment, and that's what this tiny wee book is all about, is just about letting yourself go. Yeah, great. Okay, so um, so you've got the foundation uh, behind you now. You've got a bit of uh, cash to invest in some of the um, elements of writing. Where's your focus going to be? Is it going to be on the novels? Um, to build my own novels and to build my own writing, it's to take those that regular practice and that thinking that having a regular writing practice I think or building up whether it's a hundred words a day or a thousand words a day or you know some writers manage ten thousand words a day. I have no idea how to drop the drugs. Um to, but to take that little bit at a time and then with each of the you know, you'll you'll not use all the writing and I won't use all everything that I've written to take the what I do produce and take the the best parts of it, edit it down, hone it down. That's what I really enjoy doing. I love editing. Yes. And just taking the key moments. I mean, I think this was about 20,000 words initially. I got that down to 10,000 words. Just honing it down to what I really wanted to say. And so I think taking the, the wellspring moments that I have myself every day and just batting it out. I talk about, Stephen King talks about writing and process as being like archaeology. 
I, I like to think about it as um, mine's gone blank. I like to think about it as um, sculpture. So just hacking it out of a great big bit of rock, uh, the sort of general shape of it, and then gradually through the editing process, then sort of chinking in, chinking in just a little bit of time, and then eventually polishing it all up. And then you've got your finished product, if it's ever finished. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's, a, it's another famous quote, isn't it? Well, a film director, I think I've used it before, which is, a, you know, a creative project is never finished. It's just abandoned at some point. Yes. Uh, which I think it's Francis Ford Coppola, maybe, about films. But um, I should say it's an appalling line, despite the fact we're in the same country. And yesterday, my last interview was somebody in Portland, Oregon, thousands of miles away, and it was crystal clear. And here we are, uh, really struggling. So um, we can't keep the interview going that long because I think because of the, um, uh, the quality of the line. However, I just want to finally get from you, Laura, is, is where you see yourself as a result of this new invigoration. Is this, do you want to be earning your living from writing in, in a year, two years time? Where I really see myself is with, is being published, uh, being self-published, having my novels out there, having various different collections of writing out there. Feeling a lot more confident about, about marketing those. It's the marketing, getting the word out that is the tough bit so that's I've already learned so much from the podcasts by you guys and I'm working my way through the course already I'm so motivated and you know, the fact that your podcasts and everything are so engaging really helps with that well that's great to hear Laura but you know I think people can learn from you as well so we should just say that this book is uh, definitely one for writers uh, particularly if you're struggling to um, find the time of the day every day and, and knuckle down and there's something some imaginary thing that's blocking you from uh, from getting your words down I would recommend uh, from my first look at this book uh, Wellspring so where can people find this uh, Laura and um, you'll be able to find that uh, on Amazon if you look at the keywords Wellspring and Laura Fife at the moment and you can also have a look at Figma Books um, the website which is figmapublishing.com okay Great. Well, it says five pounds on the back, which is about three dollars fifty, which is a could be a wise investment. No, on Kindle, it's only one ninety nine. Absolute bargain. There you go. Absolute bargain. What I'd like, Laura, is for you to come back on in a year's time and let us know how you're getting on. Okay, I'd love to, James. Thank you very much. I'm Ronnie Verdi. Uh, I'm an author. I write under the pen name R R Verdi. Um, right now, I'm predominantly published in the urban fantasy genre, specifically. Uh, I am working on getting a space western out this year. With, with John, I'm messing with a small publisher just to try to see how that will work out. Um, I have it signed another contract that I'm going to get the rights back if things don't work out according to my liking. So that's very nice. And I'm new to the SPF world and the scholarship uh, recipient for this year, one of the four. And it's been absolutely amazing so far. Okay. Um, Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, so that's that's no, no. that's great and a very good introduction. So, um, from the scholarship point of view, what are you hoping? What are your sort of writer ambitions uh, for the next twelve months or so? Uh, for, I want to get my production up in terms of um, speed and producing material. But the biggest thing that I know I've been ignorant on and lack is um, the marketing know-how. I am very tech savvy. I grew up as part of that generation, but I've never learned how to implement it properly. Um, and how do I guess, which is one of the things you've been covering so far in the SPF courses, how to convert people who are browsing or looking at my stuff into dedicated readers. Because a lot of my hardcore fans have come through naturally through social media, which I admit I'm very good at. Um, I'm very talkative. I'm naturally extroverted. People like me. I can get people in person or through Facebook to buy my books like within a 10, se 10 second conversation with me. But how to do that on a broader scale through Facebook, um, Twitter, and how to just get readers off Amazon to buy into my work has been an issue of mine. And so far with what I've been going through in the classes, I've I've learned a lot. And the biggest thing I've learned is how to change my mindset to embrace um, what I'm naturally good at and capitalize on it, which is something I was very ignorant on. Um, I didn't know until now how good I was with social media. And through you and Mark's courses, I've been understanding that this is a good thing and something I should be pushing harder on instead of trying to run around everywhere, um, learning to play to my strengths. Yeah, I guess it's a case of... Um ultimately you can persuade a few people to buy your books on a kind of one-on-one -on -one yeah. basis on social media but uh, to be successful to uh, to pay our salaries every year and, and and become wealthier it has to be an automated process so i guess that's what you're looking at right 
yeah, um, the automation of it, how to make sure that I come across as natural too to everybody because when I first learned about SPF and I started looking at some of the authors who were implementing it, uh, some were doing it and it seemed very cold. Their automation process, it was a very chain setup where it's like, this is my book, buy it, do this, do that. But when I started looking into you and Mark and how you do it, you guys definitely seem to make it personal. Um, and it seems like you guys are doing a great job as like treating readers as friends. And that's something I definitely wanted to learn and master in when I set up my automation. So how to make people feel like they're more part of my process than just on the reader end, that they're invested in me and my career. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think the fact that if you're good at that one-on-one -on -one stuff, social media, that's it's those principles that work on the 101 that you just somehow need to roll into it on a bigger scale. Right. Yeah. Okay. Where are you at the moment in your writing career? You've got, I mean, you're talking to a small publisher. You've got some books written. Right. Um, I, my career has been kind of weird in a good way. Um, I, I did come into the indie side very ignorant. I was trained by a lot of traditional authors. Um, I've been fortunate to have learned from guys like David Farland, um, Kevin J. Anderson, uh, some stuff with Brandon Sanderson, Jim Butcher, um, through emulation and both some workshops and seminars. And when I launched, I was going with the traditional mindset of best book possible, but I was very ignorant on marketing, um, production speeds, getting the right covers to the market, for example. I have very unique covers that are branded to my specific series, but they don't necessarily scream the genre, which is something I've been learning about. Um, but I've been fortunate in that I've been very well received. Uh, as an indie, I've gotten a lot of traditional um, blurbs and editorials from guys like Larry Correa, who's a New York Times bestseller, um, a Hugo nominee. I've been nominated for the Dragon Award twice for Best Fantasy Paranormal um, in 2016 and 2017, along guys like Jim Butcher, Brandon Sanderson, Larry Correa. Um, I'm doing conventions now, which is really cool as an indie. So I've been a guest at Dragon Con last year. I'm returning this year to do panels under the sci uh, science fiction fantasy tracks. And I'll be going to Raven Con next month as a guest, where Chuck Wendig's the guest of honor. Oh, great. Well, it sounds like you're a perfect candidate for this, but you're obviously a, a talented writer. You've been well received, as you say, so far. So you just need that little injection, that that little bit of uh, of help here and there. And we're delighted that you're a, a recipient um, in the first oh, uh, tranche of um, of uh, of our academy. So, um, how do we measure your success here? How are you going to measure your success over the next, say, twelve, eighteen, twenty four months? Uh, I hope it's not arrogant or crass to say it, but I'm, I'm trying to measure by financial metrics now because um, I've gotten to the point where I'm finally becoming confident in who I am as a writer in terms of the quality I'm producing. Uh, as I've stated, the biggest thing I've been ignorant in is just the marketing aspect of all this, how to properly build that brand, how to get my craft out there in a lot of people's um, eyes. So I, I want to measure it by increasing metrics of sales. Um, ho hopefully they stay consistent every time I have some sort of bump. I don't dip below a certain point if that's possible. Um, trying to, I guess, get more brand recognition out there. I've already done some of the stuff that you guys have mentioned, like a fan club, and it's been growing. Um, a fan group, I should say. Mm -hmm. So away from the page. And I'm getting a lot of loyal readers now who are doing things like fan art, which was something I never wow. thought I would get. Um, I have custom Funko Pops. I don't know if you're familiar with them. No a idea what you mean. Collectible. I can show you one if that's okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. That somebody made. Let's see. <laughs> Fascinated to see what a Funko Pop is. Here we go. So Funko Pops are essentially, um, they're very popular geek collectibles. A lot of famous um, TV shows, books will have their characters made into these little guys. You might have seen them. Okay. Um, a lot of younger generation are collecting them. And I've had fans who have gone out and custom made some of my characters into these little collectibles through it. And then they've shown up on social media. Um, Funko Pop actually saw that the company that makes that and they sent me a really nice letter and they featured the fact that my little characters are being turned into these wow that's great well look um in, in terms of of what we do in terms of visiting you and keeping up the story let us know how you're getting on um oh yeah in terms of that kind of tangible thing i mean are you uh, are you employed somewhere else at the moment do you, do you see yourself in 12 months time living on your writing a salary do oh you yeah F from what i've been learning already in this absolutely i think um it's going to make a huge difference in my financial income to where my, my living status will be going up. Uh, I'm fortunate right now with my particular living situation. I'm getting by with what I'm earning on writing, but I will admit it's not ideal. But what I've been learning already has been teaching me how to capitalize on so many strengths I've already just been fortunate to have. 
that I think it's going to make a probably exponential difference in my writing income. And I'm confident saying that from what I've been learning so far. Okay, fantastic. Well, I'm very excited, Ronnie, to, uh, to follow your career. Just remind us of your author name, your pen name. Uh, R.R. Verdi. Okay, and I can't help noticing there's a bit of Game of Thrones stuff going on behind you, and the, the RR <laughs> yeah. can't be a coincidence, right? In the same way that it's not a coincidence with George R.R. <laughs> Martin. Uh, yeah, both my legal names, um, Ronnie and Rambeer, uh, I figured that would be a good idea. And then after I did that, I realized that J.R.R. Tolkien, George R.R. Martin, and it's become a very popular thing in the fantasy um, genre fiction realm, so I figured I should capitalize on that. Perhaps I should become J.R.R. Blatch. I am J.R. Blatch at the moment, so I've only made one la- name off. Extra R wouldn't hurt. Yeah, exactly. Ronnie, thank you so much. We're really excited about uh, what's going to happen over the next year or so. And we're going to catch up with you again in probably, I guess, 12 months' time is most likely. Um, and okay. if, if I'm passing through Fairfax, Virginia, I'll drop in. That would be awesome. Books were always there for me. My old favorites, Little Women and Secret Garden and all those books that I grew up with. And then as I got older, I started reading Mary Stewart and some of the gothics. And that's when I really got interested in romance. And so um, I got married pretty young, had my kids. And when they got older, I finally decided it was time for me to pursue my writing career. So I wrote for five years. And I actually got started writing fanfic for the Highlander TV series. Okay. And yeah, um, uh, the um, the hero in that series was the epitome of my hero. He was always just pretty much right on as far as that went. And so I ha- I was in a group of fanfic writers and readers, and I had written all this fanfic for Highlander, and I had never let anybody read it because I was pretty scared to let anybody read my work. And I got friendly with one of the gals in the group, and her name was Bernie. And uh, she convinced me to let her read my Highlander fanfic. So uh, I sent her some things with great trepidation, and I got an email back from her, and it had a picture of her standing in her library at home and she had dozens and dozens of romance books behind her on the shelves and she said do you see all these books back here and I said yes and she said I've read every single one of those and your writing is better than any of them wow and I said oh really and she said you should write a romance novel and I said oh really (laughs) so I started out writing a romance novel about a Highlander And uh, Bernie and I eventually went to Scotland together for a 10-day trip for research. And that adventure is on my website under Diane Bernie's Excellent Scottish Adventure, which is pretty fun for people to see. There's pictures. And so I wrote that book. And, of course, then I started sending it out to agents and editors and everything and got your usual list of rejections. And uh, so then I decided I should write something about that time. It was a time travel. And about that time, the bottom fell out of the paranormal market. So I thought, okay, I need to write something more viable. So I decided on romantic suspense because that's one of the things I like to read. Plus, my mind kind of automatically goes there. Uh, A friend and I will be talking about, say, oh, the mail didn't come today. And it's like, oh, maybe somebody kidnapped the mailman and, you know, stole all the mail and they're going to run a a, uh, identity theft ring. You know, she's like, wow. okay. (laughs) so I wrote a romantic suspense and um, I based it on my own um, adventures in uh, I was in banking and we got robbed one day. Wow. And the robber was quite charming, actually. And uh, he was just, he was cute. He was charming. And uh, when the FBI came to interview me, I said, well, gosh, he was so cute and charming. And they were just like, oh, lady, uh, you know? And they call it Stockholm so, Syndrome, don't they? <laughs> yeah, I guess. I don't know. So um, I started thinking, well, what would happen if a bank teller got involved with a bank robber who was cute and charming. And I ended up writing my first, um, I had written eight books before that, but this was the first one that kind of came together 
really well. And um, I don't remember what I titled it, but I sent it out. And about a year later, it took 13 months. Wow. So, so, so the, the eight books you've ri written at this stage had been sent out, all of them? Uh, not all of them, because some of them I knew weren't viable. I had been sending around about three or four books okay. um, to different to, to every place I could think of. And how much interest and, did you get? Well, I got a lot of interest in, but <laughs> it's interesting. I would get these really opposite reactions. I would get, I, for instance, I got two letters on the same day from agents, from two different agents. One said, oh, I love your plotting, but your characters don't do anything for me. The other letter said, wow, your characters are amazing, but your storyline doesn't do anything for me. Useful. So, yes, yeah, very helpful. And I have a very strong voice. It's been described as sassy, as diff kind of sarcastic. Um, and people react one of two ways to that voice. They either love it or they hate it. So I would get, you know, really disparate um, reactions to what I was sending out. So this was a five-year period that I sent things out and kept getting rejections, rejections. I, I had about 150 rejections by the time I sent my book to Harlequin. And um, it took 13 months for them to respond. So I figured it was just like propping up a wobbly desk somewhere in their office, my manuscript. And I had pretty much given up on it at that point. So I remember I was sitting in my kitchen and the phone rang. I picked it up. And a woman said, hello, I'm looking for Diana. And I said, this is Diana. And she said, uh, this is Susan Littman from Harlequin. I love your book and we want to publish it. Wow. And I think I probably screamed in her ear. Yeah. <laughs> Poor woman. I mean, you, you danced around the After 13 Go months, ahead. you've, you've, you've forgotten about it really, haven't you? I mean, yeah, that's a yeah. fault well, from the I, blue. Yeah. I pretty much figured it was dead in the water at that yeah. point. Yes. So um, I did the happy dance around my kitchen. Luckily, we didn't have video on the phone, so she couldn't see what I was yeah. doing. But <laughs> I'm sure she imagined what was happening from all the happy noises. So um, that book that I had written about the bank robbery, that became Bulletproof Bride is what they titled it at Harlequin. And that was my first book. And uh, then I went on to write five more books for them. And uh, four of them were a series of books about uh, four brothers who are SWAT cops. And uh, each book took, took place over a 24 hour period with uh, each chapter being about an hour of the story. And uh, that was a very popular series. I just got the rights back to that and I'm going to revamp it and publish it indie. Okay. So yeah, so after the uh, six books for Harlequin, we got a new senior editor and she wasn't as enamored with my work as the previous senior editor. My editor was still really on board with my writing and everything I was doing, but the senior editor had a different vision for the line, which happens very often in publishing. And so I sent in, oh gosh, probably over a dozen proposals uh, to Harlequin over a 13 month period saying, okay, what about this? And she would say, well, I really would like to see a serial killer. So I'd write up a proposal about a serial killer and send it in. And then she'd say, well, I'd really like a military series. So I'd write up a proposal about a military series and send it in. And every time there was, well, it's not quite right. It's not quite this, it's not quite that. I finally got a clue that she wasn't going to buy anything from me anymore. So I decided that indie publishing would be the way to go. So I published six more books, uh, indie publishing, and then I got seriously ill. And it took me three years to get back to where I could actually even walk around the house again and, and you know do my regular things before I could um, kind of function even physically and mentally. And so that's when my career really stalled out and I couldn't write, I couldn't really do anything. So now I'm just kind of trying to come back from all of that and rebuild 
what I had started. Okay. And I, I made a mistake with indie publishing in that I didn't focus on one particular area of the uh, romance, romance genre or sub subgenre. I did a couple of romantic suspense. I did a couple of romantic comedies. I did a paranormal. I should have narrowed my focus and just done one subgenre at first. And so that's where I'm at now. Okay. And, uh, you know, well, that's a good time um, to bring things back. That's a good marketing lesson anyway, isn't it? That um, I mean, people do write in cross genres and across genres. Uh, and, sorry, more than one, multiple genres, I should say. But life just becomes easier in so many ways yes. when you focus on one. And uh, do you know what? It's a, you're going to think this is a strange parallel to draw, but there's a company opposite us doing a loft conversion. And uh, we're interested in it. So sort of talking to them and they are run off their feet. And that's all they do. They just do loft conversions. They're all builders. They could do anything. They could do flooring, kitchens. That's what. But do you know what? It's so e- it's not easy. But once you say this is what I do, it, all the decisions just become a little bit easier than trying to be. You know, trying to have all these plates spinning and imagery and brandings. We're going to be very different across two different genres, aren't they? Even subgenres within yes. romance. The the look and feel and yes. tone uh, between romantic yes. suspense, suspense and billionaire romance is very different. <laughs> whatever it is it is so, right yeah. it is very different so there's and, lesson number well, one and, right my hero heroine is nora roberts and i love her work and you know if i could be her oh wow if i could wave a magic wand to be nora roberts i would be and so i was kind of taking a page from her book but unfortunately she writes everything i mean she writes paranormal she writes romantic suspense she writes her jd rob series which is futuristic but she's so prolific. I mean, she writes, you know, six books a year or something. Well, you know, Diana isn't able to do that. (laughs) Well, there's, um, there's always exceptions, but you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't um, try and write like people, other people, because uh, you've got to write like yourself, haven't you? So so you're, um, I mean, how, how successful was it under Harlequin? Were you, you seeing sales and getting into lists and, and making any money from it? I was very successful at Harlequin. Yes, Uh, my first book, especially Bulletproof Bride, that they still have that. They won't give me the rights back to it because it still sells. Um, I was nominated for two Rita Awards, which I don't know if you know what that is, but that's the Romance Writers of America. It's kind of like their Oscars or their Emmys. And uh, two of my Harlequin books were, two of the SWAT series were nominated for Rita Awards. And, um, I was doing pretty well with them. The one thing that I didn't care for under Harlequin was that um, as much as I love Harlequins and as much as I love reading them when I was growing up and as much as I love writing for them, they do tend to put you in a little box and you can't write outside their box. They have certain parameters that they want you to follow and it's very strict. And so I'm loving the fact that in indie publishing, I can be as sassy and as wild as I want to be. And nobody's reining me in saying, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. (laughs) And also nobody's telling you you can't write that book. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Oh, you, you can't write a bank robber hero. I don't know how many times I heard in my rejection letters, you can't write a bank robber hero. Well, Well, yes, you can. Of course you can. (laughs) Of course you can. Everyone yes. heard of Bonnie and Clyde yes. and Thelma and Louise. Or, well, yes. Thelma and Louise is not quite the right comparison. But, I mean, the most interesting baddies stroke heroes are the complex ones, the ones where there's that tension. Mm-hmm. We're watching um, a detective series called the, the Tunnel in the UK at the moment, in season two, and they've got this fantastic baddie. She's beautiful and very tender and very loving, but we know she's got this really dark element to her and it's coming out. And that makes her so much more of an interesting... Um, person, character, right? So why would you say, yes, what, yes. what has a bank robber just got to be a bank robber, right? In a two-dimensional world and a hero's got to be right. a hero. It's, hey, forget that. Well, I cheated a little bit in that he was an undercover cop okay. and he had a really good reason to rob the bank, even though he probably broke a whole lot of rules doing that. Sounds ethically so dubious at he least. Wasn't, yeah, yes, it was, just a, a tad. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, that's good. So, so you made your you're making a, a bit of money commercial. I know with the traditional pod contracts, actually, it's quite difficult. You get your advance and so on, but um, yes, longevity yes. And, and income is is a bit more difficult to achieve like that. Yes, it trickles in. Yeah, 
Uh, you, you get paid every six months with a royalty check, and it just kind of trickles in a little at a time. After you get your first advance, you have to earn that back yeah. before you get any more money, and that takes a while. And uh, yeah, I was, I would say, you know, I, I wasn't making a whole lot of money, but I was making enough to, you know, kind of help out with our income and that sort of thing. And that was my, my goal is to just make enough to, you know, kind of supplement. But toward the end of my career, um, Harlequin changed so many of their lines and they changed a lot of their branding and they changed a lot of their marketing. And so the, the final books did not sell nearly as well as the early books did. Okay. And then you, so you moved into indie, and um, I think you said to me in an email before the interview that you, by your own admission, have struggled a bit with the marketing. It's not something that's come naturally to you. Yes, marketing is just not in my purview at all. I can write all day long, but marketing eludes me. And um, so I have actually uh, done your module, your your first module of your classes. And as I finished each lesson, I would put that lesson into effect. So I did the website lesson and then I rebuilt my website from scratch, which for a technologically impaired person, I was pretty proud of that. Yeah, that's great. And um, yeah, your tech library is very helpful with that. And I switched to a completely different web host and so I could use, I went to Wix actually. Mm -hmm. um, I, I followed some of the lessons in your tech library for some of the other sites and being so technologically challenged, I thought, well, that's not going to happen. So <laughs> I went to a place where I could pretty much drag and drop into a template. Yeah. Do you, and, I, uh, I don't know whether you're going to like to hear this or not, but we have just received the th new three-part Wix module, which is going into 101. Which oh, okay. You probably, Great. You probably could have done with six months ago, but it's uh, it's terrific. Yeah. And it's, it's both drag and drop, and also Stuart Grant's done the module. I've been looking through it, doing the editing. It's drag and drop, but there's also a kind of um, a Wix ADI, I think it's called, a kind of a, a artificial intelligence that helps to build the website for you in Wix. It all looks very clever anyway, but he's done a step-by-step, -step, which goes into our 101 course. So if perhaps when Well, you that'll help me going forward as I add to the go. website. You so, go. you know, it'll be great. So when I finished that, then I did the module on newsletters and I may, I went to MailerLite um, because it was a kind of a less expensive version of MailChimp. And I made a newsletter and I made it automatic to send out to people who subscribed to, or on my website, which I was very proud of being able to do that. I embedded a subscription form on my website. So I did that. And um, so as and then I finished, uh, I just finished the module on cover art. And I decided to go back and have a different cover artist remake some of my older covers based on what I learned from your cover art module. Um, I don't do my own cover art because, again, like marketing, that's just not my forte. And I think it's better to go to the experts for things that I don't know about because I've been struggling. And, you know, that's where your advice is going to come in to help me out, I think, so much with this um, new career path that I'm taking. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, um, you've definitely got to want to be somebody who wants to design their own covers. It is possible. We've actually got a, a new course, which is teaching people how to do that themselves. In fact, Stuart, who does the course mm -hmm. you would have watched, uh, is doing yes. that. But it's definitely not for everyone. In fact, a really interesting right. aspect of, of Stuart's course, which is, as I say, about designing your own covers, is a section on how to work with a cover designer. So, the, yes. so you understand that conversation and the brief uh, and how, yes. to, how to work with revisions and so on. So he's still right. uh, pushing people that way if that's what right. they want to do. Okay, so look, this well, is... Well, even though, even though I don't design my own cover art, the cover art module was very helpful to me in getting a vision of what to tell the cover artist, yeah. though. You know, and, and especially helpful was the advice of don't try to duplicate a scene exactly from your book. Uh, you're telling a story with the cover and it does it, it just needs to be your story it doesn't have to be necessarily specific to what is the content of the book is and that was very helpful to me in seeing the broader terms of what should go on on a cover yeah absolutely okay so how's it going with the uh, indie world Are you selling some books Diana no oh. I am not selling anything 
<laughs> I have a permanent freebie up and, um, you know, people seem to get the freebie. I think now there's so many freebies, though, that people are glomming all the freebies and I'm not sure they're even reading what they're getting. And my sales are pretty pathetic, actually. I sell in a good month, maybe $30 worth of sales in a month. Um, okay. It's a lot of my books have been up for a long time. I haven't had anything new going up and that makes a difference, but um, I just don't know how to market. Um, and I don't know how to get people to find my books. Once they find my books, they like them, I think. But getting people to find them is a very difficult thing getting that visibility. in the indie market. It's, it's saturated. It's very saturated. Okay, well, you can do this. Okay, you can do yes. this. You've got the books that people like. We know that from the history you've had in the trad world. So it is a yes. case. You've got to carry on playing through that 101 course and get to the more yes. marketing bits yes. for Facebook ads and so on. And, um, and yes, I, I, that's I, where I'm going now. Yes. Yeah, my, my hunch is that uh, we'll catch up with you in 12 months or so, and I think you will have found a way of, of making this work. So it is competitive, though, isn't it, yes. out there now? It is. It is. And... The, the thing is, though, with my four swap books that I have that I got the rights back to from Harlequin, and then I had, before I got sick um, and during my illness, I kind of pecked away at, uh, I have three time travel books. Well, I have two and two thirds of a, of a time travel series, uh, Highlander time travel, which I go back to my Scottish roots every time for that. And when the Outlander series uh, became a series on TV, I had read it in book form and fallen in love with Jamie Fraser and the, I love time travels, I love paranormal romance. So I had thought, well, gosh, I should write a time travel series because that's gonna become really popular with this new Outlander TV show. So uh, again, spreading myself a little thin there, I had gone back to paranormal. So I potentially have the ability to get seven books published this year. Okay. Um, and I think that's really, once I get the marketing part of your class down, that's really going to take off, I hope. Yeah, and uh, definitely getting getting product on the shelf is an important part of it as well. Yes. Um, how do you write then, Diana? When do you write? How do I write? Um, I write by the seat of my pants which unfortunately uh, tends to come back and bite me a little bit, hence the two and two thirds Highlander books because I'm waiting to figure out how the series ends okay. in the third book. Um, I write, I sit down in the morning and mornings are not my best time. I'm not a morning person. And I usually think to myself, well, I'm going to start writing now. But what really happens is I end up doing email and Facebook and that sort of thing for a couple of hours. And then about 11 o'clock, I think, oh gosh, I haven't done any writing yet. So <laughs> then I'll go open my file and between 11 and say four in the afternoon is usually my best writing time. And um, I just kind of make it up as I go along. And you know, when I wrote for Harlequin, I did have to write synopsis for them to sell. I, I sold on proposal after my first book which they had the full manuscript so you have to write three chapters in a synopsis of what's going to happen in the book you have to write the, fir the first three chapters or just sort of random beginning um, middle and you end have to, no you have to write the first three chapters okay. you have to write the first three chapters of the book and then tell them what's going to happen in the rest of the book okay well oftentimes i just again would make up things off the top of my head and what i told them was going to happen didn't <laughs> And things that I never told them would happen did, but they, they were okay with that. They were all right with that. Um, so I'm trying to do a little bit better and plot a little bit better so I don't write myself into a corner or so that I at least have an outline of what I'm going to do for the day rather than sitting down and thinking, okay, what happens next? But a lot of my writing process takes place away from the computer uh, when I'm in the shower at night before I go to sleep, in the morning when I first wake up, that's when my brain is thinking of, okay, what happens next in the story. So, and do you is it, I write, do you have like a notepad, and, not in the shower, but a notepad and pen by the side of the bed and stuff, or do you just mull things over? I actually do. I have notepads and pens everywhere. I actually do have one outside oh, in the, shower. the shower. Okay, <laughs> you can <laughs> always write it in the me, mist. But, yeah, write it on the wall. And so, yeah. uh, my my husband bought me a lighted a pen that lights up. 
because I would wake up in the middle of the night and turn the nightlight on and I would lean over the edge of the bed and scribble notes. Waking him up. <laughs> Waking him up. So he bought me a pen that lights up. So I have a little notebook and a pen right on my nightstand. And then when I wake up and I have thoughts, I can just jot them down without disturbing him now. So they're yeah. great, those pens. Yeah. Mark Dawson, John Dyer and I used to be film examiners in a previous life. And we were the only people who had those pens in Britain. So you'd sit in cinemas with your notepad and, and light it up so you could look down and make write your notes. <laughs> the only people writing notes, watching films, that's what we used to do. Yeah, I know those. Okay, so you're, you're a panster, panzer, panzer, I don't know how to say it, but- um, Panzer, yes. Panzer, yeah, you see the pan stuff. And, um, uh, and in terms of your kind of word count and stuff, I mean, that all sounds very um, uh, familiar, the slight procrastination <laughs> before you get down to writing. Yes. But do you do, are you disciplined about your word counts and so on? I try to be, um, I don't write fast. That's another thing that is goes against me in the writing world is I tend to be kind of perfectionistic about my writing and I'm trying to get better about that as well. But if I get a thousand words a day, that's a pretty good day for me. Um, you, that's, you, I, that's what I shoot for. Are you trying to write it in perfect form the first time? You don't, yes, you don't sadly, allow yourself yes. to write scrappy and leave errors in there and come back? No. No, although I've gotten better about that, you know, my critique partners and I, um, we've developed a system where if we don't know what to say, like we'll say, and then he went to the, and then we just write in blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, but, and then he went to the blah, 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 and then he did a blah, 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 and he met a person whose name was character name, you know, so we're trying to be a little bit better about that and not be so perfectionistic, but the way that I write is I go back to what I wrote the day before, before I start into the new stuff. And I kind of um, enhance that or hone that, kind of um, edit it a bit so that I can then I'm in the mindset to jump into the new stuff. And so when I get done, I pretty much have a finished draft. I don't have to do a whole lot of revising when I finish. So it's slower but then I don't have that time. I do go back and revise several times, but it's not usually major revision. Yeah, okay, well, so you pick up some time there when other people may redraft. Other people like yes. me may redraft three times trying to uh, <laughs> right. trying to get there, so, okay. Good. Well, look, um, we had a, a little bit of rain in the uh, line while you were talking then. So it kind of got a bit crackly and then it, it stripped out some of the higher frequencies in your voice. It sounded, you dropped a few octaves, which was quite amusing for us listening to you for a second, <laughs> but you're back. You're back now sounding okay. normal. But I was just sort of explain that to uh, people listening because it, uh, it was um, it was quite good. It wasn't quite... I'm just talking in my sexy yeah, it was voice like that. now. It was, it was like a kind of handsome <laughs> bank robber, I thought. That's what, uh, that's what it sounded like to me. <laughs> Give me your money and your lipstick. Okay, good. Diana, look, it's been brilliant speaking to you. Um, we're so pleased uh, you had a serious illness of five years and here you are smiling, laughing and talking to us here, which is the, the number one thing we should say that. So congratulations for getting yourself to thank you uh, to where you are now. Thank you. Thank you. It's I think this is going to be so fun doing your course and following all the steps. I think it's just going to be fun and exciting. And I can't wait to, like you said, come back a year from now and tell you that, wow, my sales are through the roof and everything is just really spectacular. Well, I, I honestly, I feel optimistic about it. I mean, there, we criticize the gatekeeping and I think this interview has illustrated why that gatekeeping um, wasn't a great thing, a positive thing overall, because you're getting to write now and, and people will appreciate that. But you know what, to get through that system, even though it took 13 months for them to, to, to get around to calling, to get through that system, to get published and for them to be interested in that, that shows a very high level of writing that you've got just to start off with. So you're going to be successful. You just need to crack this next bit and we'll join you perhaps you. in a year's time, Diana, and find out where you are. Okay. Sounds wonderful. Thank you, James. Uh, really lovely interviews. I loved speaking to them. and loved Ronnie. Uh, I think he's going to be a big star online, Ronnie. He's got the charisma. He's got the whole Star Wars geek thing going on, which, of course, I'm hugely admiring of. And he's got a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of personality. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a, you know, this was an idea we had knocking about for a little while, and it's taken us uh, probably we should say to Mrs. Dawson actually is the one who's really pulled a finger out and, and organised it and made sure this has happened. So all credit to uh, to Lucy there for getting going and uh, a good thing for us to do. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty. It's a it's a good deal for these guys because they get both of the courses, and we also I can't remember exactly how much it was now, but it was a decent amount of money on uh, to spend on Reedsy on uh, pro services and covers and. Two and a half thousand was it each? Something along those lines. Two and a half, three thousand, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So <clears> quite <throat> a quite a, a good chunk of change to get their their books um, ship shape and ready for action. So um, yeah, it's nice to be able to do that. We we've, we've been thinking about it for a little while. It was Lucy's idea, um, and we are. I mean, we, we're taking applications now. It's an annual thing, so we'll do it again um, towards the end of this year. So if people are interested, there's um, a place to sign up on the website at subcultureinformer.com. Um, and there are some requirements that you need to meet, um, but provided that you meet them, we will. You can apply, and we'll we'll take a look at your at your books and what you've got to offer, and we'll we'll select some more scholars um, towards the end of the year. Yeah, and it's going to be really exciting to follow up on uh, on Dora, Ronnie, and Diana uh, in time to see how they get on. We've got a good feeling about all of them actually, and I think that. Um, uh, certainly a couple of them I think could fly and we'll see how, see where we get to with that. Good. Okay. So it's been a very SPF orientated episode, um, but that's good because we are SPF. Very good. Well done, James. Yeah, well spotted. We are Sparta. <laughs> Should get, get t-shirts done. I'm, I still haven't got my pin. I'm a bit disappointed about that. Have you got your pin yet? Um, I cool. have. I've got one pin. Oh, yes. I should probably, I should probably wear it, but um. Yeah, I know that there are they're in the country now, so they're being they're being shipped. I think I've seen a couple on social media. I think uh, Catherine RVA is actually coming around for dinner in a couple of weeks, and I think she's going to bring the pins then. So I'm excited about this. Only if she, if she comes empty-handed, she's going home. You're empty, empty stomached. She's going home empty stomach. I'll take the wine, obviously, that she brings. But if there's no pin, that's it. She's off. Um, yeah, they look very Star Trek esque. I think a little uh, communicator type pin, which is. Uh, how we're going to communicate in the future <laughs> absolutely good okay mark thank you very much indeed thank you so much indeed for uh, listening to this episode today i hope you enjoyed it and uh, thank you to our patron and our foundation applications just to reiterate what mark said if you would like to apply uh, to be a scholar in the self-publishing formula foundation as, a, as mark says there is some criteria to meet but all of that is clear on the website go to selfpublishingformula.com and on the top banners uh, sort of drop down menus you will see an spf foundation tab click on that great thank you very much have a good week writing and a good week selling and we will speak to you next friday bye-bye you've been listening to the self-publishing formula podcast visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information show notes and links on today's topics you can also sign up for our free video series on using facebook ads to grow your mailing list if you've enjoyed the show please consider leaving us a review on itunes we'll see you next time we